All right, everyone, let's get the show started. Welcome to our DevOps office hours. It's September 29th, 2021. My name's Eric Osterman, and I'll be leading the conversation. I'm the founder and CEO of CloudPosit. We're a DevOps accelerator, and that means that we help companies own their infrastructure in record time by building it together with your team while showing them the ropes. So if that sounds interesting, head over to cloudposse.com slash quiz to get started. For those of you new to the call, the format's very informal. My goal is to get your questions answered. So feel free to unmute yourself at any time if you wanna jump in and participate. If you're tuning in from our podcast or YouTube channel, you can register for these live and interactive sessions by going to cloudposse.com slash office hours. Again, that's cloudposse dot com slash office hours. We host these calls every week. Our call today is recorded. We'll automatically post a video recording of this session to our YouTube channel. So if you enjoy the content and want to support it, please hit those like and subscribe buttons. So with that said, let's kick this off. I have an overwhelming number of announcements uh, to bring up today. Um, so let's get started. So one of the first things I wanted to bring up was uh, CloudSmith, who's one of our partners. Uh, we had them on the show uh, was it last year sometime. CloudSmith is an awesome service for hosting packages for pretty much every package management system out there from all the Linux uh, packages, APM, uh, Debian, RPM, uh, APK, et cetera. They support NPM packages and Helm packages and you name it. They make it very easy for package management. So they raised uh, 15 million just uh, end of last week or so, I think. Uh, they're gonna go on a hiring spree, uh, you know, bringing on 60 people and expanding the capabilities of the platform. So uh, yeah, big congrats to the folks at CloudSmith. The other announcement uh, is on the Cloud Posse side. Um, now, this is not gonna be like my, the, the big announcement. Um, this is just a little heads up for everyone following and it's been using uh, Atmos already. Uh, we still need to uh, update the docs here uh, for this, but we have uh, pulled the trigger. We did a complete rewrite of Atmos in Go. Uh, this version uh, fixes a lot of the warts that we had in the variant-based version that were just too hard to solve. Uh, we now support uh, nested components, uh, nested uh, stack configurations, Terraform, uh, backend uh, config generations. Um, now it uses uh, the same Go uh, under the hood. It's using the same uh, Go modules for deep merging. So the experience of using our uh, Terraform module for stack configurations. Uh, Terraform YAML stack config, yep, this one is now compatible with our command line tool version, which is uh, Atmos. So same, same, uh, same experience in both places. For those of you not familiar with Atmos, Atmos is uh, Cloud Posse's original tool for how we are managing infrastructure with all of our customers. Uh, we have this concept of a stack configuration uh, that looks uh, like this. It's uh, in YAML and it's a single, single place to define all of your components that comprise a stack. So, you know, uh, Terraform best practice is to have lots of smaller um, Terraform root modules. We call those opinionated root modules components. And when you want to have, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of environments, copying lots of files over and doing that is a very tedious. So we have this concept of uh, a YAML configuration that we can run on the command line using Atmos that we can uh, read from Terraform using our uh, Terraform module, which behind the scenes uses a Terraform provider that we wrote that understands the stack configurations and is not specifically for Terraform. So I know we're a very Terraform heavy audience, so that's why I focus on that, but we use it for a uh, Helm file as well. We're gonna be adding Packer support to it. Uh, we have um, uh, bigger plans for it, especially now that it's in Go. I expect that we'll get a lot more contributions since it's a language we all know and love. So if you, if you haven't yet checked it out and you're using one of our earlier versions of Atmos, uh, 1.0 is the new Go-based release. Uh, it's, it adds a lot of um, uh, convenient, a lot better uh, 
communication about what's going on. It outputs more verbose uh, log messages. It shows you what the rendered configurations look like, uh, better error handling all around. So that's that. Um, another little thing that came up in my news feed is this. I thought this was interesting. So one password now supports uh, randomly generated email addresses. Now you can't use this with your own email provider. Uh, like if you have your own hosted domain or something, but it works together with Fastmail. And the reason why you might want to do this is uh, to avoid some of the common phishing attacks where you have the same email address at, you know, 200 sites that you're on. Instead, now you can have random email addresses, random passwords everywhere you're at, just uh, another layer to improving your security posture. Are you sure it doesn't work with custom domain? I have uh, now with a custom domain and I set this up yesterday and it asked it? me, hey, do, do you want to use uh, your custom domain or do you want to use at fastmail.com? I think it was. Oh, no, like, yeah, I want to use fastmail.com because if I use my own domain, like it's useless. <laughs> I'm still spamming myself and there's no privacy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah, haven't yeah, tested I it though. I haven't created any new accounts on any website since yesterday. Exactly. So like, for example, my domain that I use for my emails, you know, you know, Osterman.com, doesn't matter if I have lots of randomized email addresses, they'll know pretty much who I am. But I guess if you're using Fastmail with randomized email addresses, it does add an, an additional layer of anonymity. And that is cool, though, nonetheless, that it supports your own custom domains. I haven't tried setting it up yet. So that's cool. Uh... All right, I'm going to skip over four briefly because uh, that's going to be a longer talking point. Uh, let's talk about another quick announcement which um, came up in my uh, Twitter feed, which is uh, I don't know if Amazon's announced it yet, but everyone is posting lots of screenshots on uh, Twitter that now you can deploy ARM64, which is the Graviton uh, processors with Lambda. And that's beneficial because the Graviton pricing is a lot more competitive than the uh, Intel AMD pricing. So uh, anybody have anything else to add to this? Surprise is coming before Fargate support for Graviton instances. That's I mean, really I mean, a surprise. Oh, that is coming for Lambdas before it comes to ECS? To Fargate. Yeah, it's a surprise. I expected yeah. it to go from like the lowest stack possible. So they launched EC2 instances yeah. on Graviton 2 processors. They launched managed databases and stuff like that. I didn't expect them to go the complete opposite and go to the highest level offering. But yeah. awesome release. Well, in yeah, progress that's, release. That's really good news for anyone doing serious uh, Lambda processing. This tool uh, has the potential for re reducing your costs. Obviously, your, uh, your underlying languages and binary still need to work on Graviton. So you'll need to uh, cross compile for that. Uh, what else? Uh, oh, uh, this was interesting. I admit that I missed this uh, announcement. Uh, it was brought to my attention by following Anton's wonderful newsletter. He pointed out uh, this uh, article. And so while Taint was deprecated, a much better interface was introduced, which allows you to basically, when you call apply, you can just add the uh, replace argument. Um, and then it will uh, reprovision those resources. Yeah. So it, it's basically combining um, Taint with plan or taint with apply, depending on how you invoke it. So here they show how you can have replace at, as part of your plan, which is convenient if you have like an Atlantis workflow or something, uh, or if you're just, uh, you know, uh, you know flying uh, dangerously, you can call it directly with your apply command. So you can, and target also specifically the resources you want replaced. So I, I dig that. Although there is one thing which uh, uh, I personally find quite uh, hard to even understand is all of these arguments. I mean, okay, Terraform apply uh, was the best command ever because normally you don't specify any arguments to it. Now, if you want to do replace, you specify dash replace. If you want to destroy mm -hmm. it, you specify Terraform apply dash destroy. Come on, do I apply or do I destroy it? <laughs> 
Yeah, that, uh, well, I mean, to me, to me to this would be the best practice for any like for any CI process. Yeah. This is the process, but it's more or less the same point, right? So now you're 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 adding lots of arguments to the plan. Those arguments are not um, deterministic, or they're not defined in code. Uh, mm -hmm. so this is why, like, there needs to be an, there needs to be a, ultimately it just comes down to this fact that there needs to be a layer on top of Terraform itself. Uh, for example, TF migrate, um, haven't, we, we haven't adopted that as part of our process, but, uh, there need, there should be a way to do Terraform commands in a purely GitOps way without arguments like this. Yeah, but uh, I, I, I'm still, uh, like uh, not uh, entirely uh, kind of able to even understand what kind of comments are there. Because for example, there is Terraform apply refresh only or Terraform apply uh, no refresh or Terraform mm. apply just refresh. Now we have uh, dash replace, dash destroy. And all of these are uh, like uh, flags to apply comments. Yeah, for me it's just uh, broken logic. I mean, I like to have Terraform apply, Terraform replace, Terraform destroy, Terraform uh, whatever else. Oh. I don't mind so, to run it uh, sequentially. Uh, uh, so, so I would disagree with that. But I'm, um, you know, so the, I, I, for example, I really hated uh, that Terraform destroy was a separate command, and when they added the argument to Terraform plan with the argument of destroy, that made perfect sense to me because you want to have a plan for everything. So to me, to me, I think all the arguments like this should be removed from apply. And I think apply should only accept plan files and that everything should go through a plan and apply workflow. Uh, what I don't, what I would like to see augmented is uh, that there should be some declarative descriptive way to capture these kinds of operations in code for a GitOps uh, workflow. Yeah. So, yeah. so this is what's missing here. Um, well, I don't know if it's uh, being developed, uh, to be honest. I mean, I, I didn't see any progress in this direction. But quite interestingly, yesterday I discovered one of my uh, old tweets where I pointed on some of uh, things which people wanted to have and the one which you are covering right now was actually one of this. So let me find it. It's quite, quite interesting. interesting. It was yeah. about like from Hashi Conf. I don't remember which Hashi Conf. Yeah, it was June 2020. Wow. So that's, so, uh, yeah, well, well it's, uh, yeah, over a year ago, but it's still relevant, I, I believe. Yeah. Uh, and that's actually an interesting segue into this other one, also through weekly.tf, um, the newsletter uh, that Anton has. So Terraform lessons in real life. And I thought these were good, but what I thought was really interesting is how it really depends on sometimes your perspective. So, hmm. uh, uh, so like, a, like one of the things like, you know, version all your Terraform, all your providers and use uh, strict uh, minor pinning. Well, that was one of those things that we thought that was the best practice too, until we realized that we had all of these cycles in our hundreds of Terraform modules. And that when we updated one and that module also had tests that were trying to invoke a module that was on another provider. And then we weren't able to test anything in our infrastructure because we didn't allow newer versions to be tested with older versions, if that makes sense. So our recommendation right now, at least if you're developing open source modules in a tight interconnected ecosystem is use lower bound pinning, but uh, not upper bound pinning and not the uh, minor pinning that we see uh, here with the tilde greater than. Well, I, I think uh, the point of this article is that uh, obviously the author uh, is not maintaining a large collection of modules. So that's yeah. why for his infrastructure, it works well. But yeah, you definitely have uh, another type of experience. So. Exactly. So exactly. And that, that's why it meant depends on the use case. So uh, for our customers, I do recommend doing more strict pinning in their top level root modules, what we call components. Uh, and I think it works well there. And that's also something that the customer then is in full control over. 
Um, uh, the, and, you know, to some degree that's mitigated now with the lock files as well, if you're committing those, which is a whole another can of worms. So the, the other one is interesting, which I want to agree with this statement as much as possible, use for each instead of count. And for each, you know, should kind of be the holy grail. Like one of the biggest problems using counts is like in the old days, if you wanted to maybe provision 20 ECR uh, repositories, then you would have a count. And if you change the size of that uh, list, it would destroy everything and recreate everything. And that's not what you wanted. Fortunately, when you use for each, it will remain stable. It won't destroy any uh, of the resources that didn't get removed from the list. And it'll only destroy the ones that were removed or add the ones that were added. However, what we have found was is a very consistent failure of for each to work if you have any form of dynamic uh, if you use for each on dynamic outputs. Um, so an example of this would be uh, getting a list of repositories, maybe from remote state of another module. And then this for each wouldn't work. It, it's kind of like back in the day, count also had this problem, like uh, count of cannot be computed, which is I think one of our most popular uh, uh, pages on our blog. Well, that has that um, that has almost gone away now, um, with uh, count of. So we have actually had to revert from using for each in some places to using count, vice versa. I don't I don't think we have a full understanding of when it works or when it doesn't because we can still do it sometimes on dynamic lists and other times we can't. Well, uh, yeah, it's kind of hard to figure out. I completely agree. But uh, what I can say is that if the values uh, which are mentioned inside of count are already well known, like to, to the very end, then it has high probabilities to succeed. Mm. Uh, but it's like 90% uh, answer to the question. <laughs> Still, there are situations like I have no clue why it doesn't work. Yeah, uh, it's, it's one of those things. Anecdotally, it seems to be if you do this <laughs> and, yeah. and, uh, and and perform some rituals, then it works. Mike, were you going to think? Think? Yeah, well, I was just going to say there's some other scenarios that are still just annoying with for each because, say, for instance, I have a list of objects that depend on a KMS key. And every time I run plan, it wants to update the KMS key on the object that depends on the mm -hmm. KMS key, even though it's already, everything is known at the time that the plan is being computed, not even applied, but computed, you know? So then you, if you run apply, there's zero changes because everything stays the same, but it, it still thinks that because this is a list that it has to process, and then based on that processing, do something, it thinks that it still needs to do something. I suppose you could do a life cycle ignore on that, but I mean, well, I, I don't now, like life cycle ignores. Well, a couple other considerations. Uh, sometimes uh, what I've seen happen is um, it, it, whether it, it, if, you do, if you don't do it in the same order, like the list might not be in the same order, or two would be sometimes Amazon is using like the non-alias uh, ARN for some things and you're yes. using the alias ARN. So if you just use the non-alias one, then it would stop doing that. Um, I don't know. That's No, that's a good point. Yeah, usually it's it's list order that causes that that sort of constant plan, like showing that there's a change there. Um, but I was just gonna say on another note with count is that if if Terraform core language on a module just uh, introduced an, an enabled flag for a module, um, <laughs> I think that I think it would get rid of like ninety percent of the usage of count in the language itself. <laughs> It's a good point. I think almost yeah. all, like, I mean, clearly some people are doing count for like other reasons, but like count is used all over the place for like an enabled flag, like, you yeah. know, everywhere. So, yeah. Um, let's see what one of the other uh, points was here. Use secure and remote states. Yeah, that goes without saying. Um, we obviously have our cloud policies, uh, TF state backend module, which we use. Um, going all in on Terraform, 
Um, I, I had mixed feelings on this one. I used to <laughs> be a lot more adamant about like using the right tool for the job. And I, I didn't like Terraform working with Kubernetes and I, I still kind of don't, but we have decided to go more into Terraform. Like we were using a lot more Helm file before. Now we're using a lot more of the Helm provider uh, for deploying the Kubernetes backing services. I still don't like Terraform as part of application delivery. I still think it's a better tool for infrastructure delivery. So that's why, I, like, I don't tell our developers to deploy their Kubernetes apps with Terraform. And uh, tools, yeah, lots of tools in the ecosystem. All right, any, uh, any other comments on this, Anton or others? Well, I'm muted, I, I forgot. <laughs> so yeah, I have actually uh, uh, some mixed feelings uh, about uh, how, how I, am I thinking uh, going forward with migration from Calm to for each for a large amount of resources where it actually makes sense. And uh, the example which, uh, uh, which is shown in this, for example, for subnets is pretty good example because sometimes mm -hmm. like in our case, we would like to have uh, possibility to create subnets without thinking about order. So that's why we want to have them some sort of name and uh, some sort of properties like in which uh, availability zone, which seed range, which tags, uh, what type of subnet, for example. So we would like to have something like this. But uh, the biggest challenge is not actually implementing it. The biggest challenge is what to do with all these users who are already using this stuff. Yeah, migrate, and migrating, how, changing the interface. Basically. Exactly. And how we can just yeah. say like, oh, guys, now run this Terraform state MV command in these 500 combinations and uh, do it in production. Yeah, TF migrate is the only option which I know uh, out there, which, uh, which we probably will use because uh, Terraform uh, migration path is not moving forward from what I can say. I mean, Terraform yeah. itself has the same feature. Uh, designed and discussing uh, has been happening for some time, but this seems to be pretty good. Uh, I actually like this implementation more than the one which is inside of Terraform itself because it's much uh, more uh, kind of thought through to me, it seems. Yeah. Well, and this is also yeah. declarative, like you have a config describing the migrations versus the Terraform command, it's more like uh, command line operations performed by a human, you no, still have to have. In Terraform, uh, I mean, in Terraform core, they're designing exactly the same statement like migration and uh, have it as part of your HCL file. And then oh, you oh, run. Uh, yeah, so that's that. uh, so they're, they're doing exactly. Well, I will find it uh, okay. and send a okay. link to the chat. So they're doing very similar things, but this is. Uh, much more uh, kind of um, much better design to me, it seems, mm -hmm. this one. But yeah, I will send link and send it to chat now. That's cool. All right, let's see. Next announcement would be, uh, yeah, uh, Vlad just brought this one to my attention here. Uh, this is cool because now you can get the best of both worlds between an ALB and an NLB. Uh, so previously there was no practical way to front a load balancer with a network load balancer because the network load balancer couldn't target the ALB dynamically or like by reference. You'd have to have like a Lambda and yeah, don't get me started. When, and, and when anybody says just use a Lambda, uh, then, then something's wrong, I think. Um, so use cases for why you might want to do this is that you want to use the same host name, uh, but serve some traffic, which is uh, only, you know, which is, you know, a custom protocol, maybe UDP. And then you also want to have an HTTP on the same uh, protocol, uh, uh, say, sorry, on the same uh, host name, and then route that to your application load balancer. Another use case is uh, NLBs support uh, static IPs. So this would allow you to have a static IP together with your ALB. Now, one of the like mind blowing things to me uh, that NLBs don't support is security groups. 
So like one, sometimes we wanted to be able to expose an RDS database, like for developers that's sitting in a private VPC, and we thought, oh, we'll just put a NLD there and you know lock it down to uh, the you know the office side or range or something. Well, you can't do that because NLDs don't support security groups. So I think this supports you know a specific uh, use case uh, that I described. Uh, previously, what we would use is like a global accelerator if we needed a static IP fronting an ALB. Uh, so I guess there's an alternative for that. I had another use case for that as well. Uh, we're setting up API gateways that um, are, it's not the um, it's not the HTTPS API gateways, but the other ones that can forward traffic directly to a resource. But our instance, like basically EC2 instances. But our EC2 instances are in private subnet, so we have to use a mm -hmm. VPC endpoint to access that. And mm -hmm. to do that, we put the NLB kind of in between everything. So the API gateway talks to the NLB. NLB forwards the traffic to this instance that's located in the private subnet. But to find the instance, you have to, yeah, I mean, different crazies for an architecture, but these instances are also attached to an uh, application load balancer. So we have to figure out, okay, from this application load balancer's target group, what instances are in that target group? Now, instead of having to do all that calculation, which we can do with Terraform, we could just say, hey, and it'll be forward to this application load balancer and the request will get to where it needs to go. So it just kind of, yeah. it really simplifies the uh, Terraform side of things. Yeah, that makes sense. Anyone else excited about this or have a use case? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm very excited about it, Patrick here. I, um, all our applications are deployed in uh, various VPCs and we use uh, VPC endpoints uh, mm -hmm. to communicate so that all our uh, communication between various deployed services stay on the AWS backbone. And yeah, I mean, I can't tell you, I, I must have 30 of these damn lambdas deploy right now. <laughs> really? and, and, and actually they wow. all just, they all just work. I have no issues mm -hmm. with them, but it's still freaking annoying. And and then, uh, yeah. you know, have an upgrade to Lambda to latest Python versions that no one else maintains. And uh, uh, it's, uh, yeah, I'm very excited about it. This is awesome. I'm surprised I missed this and glad I showed up today. <laughs> Sweet. Well, that's why you stopped by office hours, right? All right. Uh, next announcement is something that popped up. Uh, Lauren in Sweet Ops shared this. I also saw it pop up in my newsfeed and other places. Um, it's pretty it cool. also shared in my PTF. Sorry to interrupt you. <laughs> okay, I'm, but, done, uh, I'm sure. But about, about a couple months ago. Oh, okay. So yeah, yeah, that, that would make sense that it'd come on your radar first. And this is a nice little visualization you can deploy uh, to see your Terraform state backend. It, sorry, sorry, to visualize your Terraform state across all the resources. Now, I don't know if this will work across uh, remote states or if it's only showing you the visualization of one remote state. Do you know about that, Anton? Uh, I think it uh, it only works in place where you execute it right now. So you have access okay. to one state right now, so you can see it only. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, but I didn't try it myself because I'm usually uh, not a user for such tools myself because I'm lost in this diagram. Yeah, it, I, I well, I think this is also a bad screenshot because it's hard to visualize it. Uh, it's too compressed <laughs> and you don't see what it says here. Um, I, I found it useful. Uh, I mean, it's useful when just uh, giving an overview or explaining it to uh, new hires, for example, uh, parts of your architecture in real time. However, I, yeah, personally, I don't go here to understand or triage anything more or less. Uh, to there is nothing better than, uh, there is absolutely nothing better than outdated PowerPoint, I think. <laughs> All right, so now let's uh, talk about the, the, uh, the real item here of today. Uh, there's been a lot of controversy you know, over the past year uh, with AWS's handling of the various open source um, uh, projects. Uh, it all started with, I guess, MongoDB uh, and DocumentDB moved into like you know, Elasticsearch and now open versus open source territory and uh, many other projects as well. Well, I guess you could say that uh, the 
to, to similar degree, but different degree. It's not like they are uh, necessarily wholesale lifting uh, community modules, but Amazon has come out with their own um, official uh, Terraform module repository, which uh, just you know, has left a bad taste in some people's mind. It, it's, it's very green. It's not very mature. Yeah. The, the modules look uh, not like they were written by you know, serious Terraform users or very uh, advanced Terraform users, at least. So uh, I don't know where to uh, uh, you know, jump off from here. Um, anyone want to uh, pick up on this conversation? Well, I personally feel already uh, that this is so well beaten horse on Twitter, so I don't have anything new to say to everyone. Yeah, yeah, there's uh, a couple yeah. uh, uh, interesting Twitter posts r relating to it. I think largely I also it's shared. Like... Yeah, go on, uh, Vlad. I also shared my thoughts on Twitter, not much. It's seven eight. <laughs> no I always wondered. Much else to add, like. This is terrible code, which is not new. AWS does shitty things. AWS releases shitty examples. That's fine. That's happened for forever. It's going to keep happening. It's not ideal for customers. It's not ideal for the community. But it happens. People learn to ignore it. But AWS launched shit Terraform modules and encouraged customers to use them. Like, we talked about it. This was released at the end of June, I think, and it was covered during office yeah. hours yeah uh, we were ignoring them yeah everybody yeah. ignored them a couple of, about a week ago i think something like that they started marketing those terraform modules so really? genuinely saying hey you should use this which crosses the line it's yeah. aws pushing a clearly defective product to customers that's wrong it's AWS pushing shit practices to customers. Yeah. I have in my Twitter that it's not only AWS IA, it's also AWS Temple, where they're showcasing, hey, this is how you should do Kubernetes and Terraform. And it's an absolute mess of modules of horrible Terraform code. It's it's just terrible. And again, we expect, we've made peace with AWS releasing terrible examples like this. But then actually suggesting people should use this in production, that's a whole new thing. And it terrifies me that AWS was able to do this, that it went through all the processes of AWS and we've reached the state. And this is really hurting the whole environment. Like, no, we don't know what. Terra is Terra services, Terra model. We don't have any design patterns. No, just throw some code in there, make a big mess. Nobody understands it. Everybody's going to hate Terraform if they try working off the AWS examples or modules. <laughs> that's just... almost why I wonder why, like, sometimes I almost wonder if that's the, you know, deliberate, like uh, ECS Fargate versus EKS and some of the warts that still exist with EKS operating in the AWS ecosystem. Sometimes I wonder if it's almost deliberate to sabotage the success of Kubernetes in the AWS to drive more people to yeah, AWS technologies. Almost like, hey, you can try Terraform, but you're probably going to want to use CloudFormation in the end anyways. No, so CDK is the new thing. But I'm, I'm relatively a good guy at Terraform. It took me forever to understand what they're doing in the ECAS Quick Start. And again, I'm an AWS container hero. I've yeah. been working with Kubernetes for forever. I've been working with AWS for forever. I've been working with Terraform for forever. I couldn't understand it. Like, yeah. Seriously, is that what you want to push to customers? And the fact that they are still actively pushing this is, is shocking to me. And I'll defer the rest to what I've said in the Twitter thread. Yeah. Let's see, any other uh, comments? Well, the final Those... comment which I have received from, uh, from, uh, from AWS, uh, was that uh, don't worry, everything will be fine. Uh, we take this seriously and somebody will be fired. So hopefully not me. <laughs> I think that's the wrong thing to do. Like folks shouldn't be fired for it. This was a process yeah. failure. This was not an individual failure. It's not the fault of the engineers that worked on this. It's not the fault of their managers. It's a process failure. That's what should be highlighted here. Like I'm well, saying the shit, yes, but it's 
not the and I wanna stress this. I don't think it's the fault of the GitHub users that wrote this. I don't think it's the fault of the engineers. Period. No, obviously, not. they no, no, no. weren't the one deciding this, and they shouldn't get any hate. No, no, no this no. is a process failure on the AWS side. It's a marketing failure on the AWS side, and it's many things. But I don't think firing people is the right answer. No, I, I seldom think that's the right answer. And you don't learn from it. We'll see. Our initial thought when we saw this, I think a couple of weeks ago, maybe one week ago, was that, uh, oh, that's uh, AWS intention to kill Terraform so people can start using CDK. And we were laughing and it was like, oh yeah, funny, funny. And then they start <laughs> uh, announcing it and marketing it. And then we say like, oh my God, it's, it's, get, it's getting real. <laughs> Yeah, like, like the, I mean, the, like these research sample host, the sample connection. That's a uh, unusual choice of. Uh, well, there is actually another uh, very interesting point, which is, uh, uh, like, I, I honestly don't understand if people uh, think about this uh, this way. A uh, couple uh, influential people, I don't know the names or position in AWS and in HashiCorp, said that. Uh, modules were designed to be uh, like pretty much like inspiration. So mm -hmm. that's why uh, whatever you yeah. do in Terraform AWS modules is just for inspiration. So we are allowed to do whatever we want. And I, when I heard this for the first time, I was like, are you real? I mean, people use, uh, people download this stuff uh, so actively, use a daily introduction just for inspiration. <laughs> Uh, so, I, yeah. I, Anton makes a really good point here. This is not just AWS. This is a collaboration between HashiCorp and AWS, That's which correct, is yeah. even more of a mindfuck. Excuse my but, language. What exactly? I mean, that it's really weird that they didn't uh, reach out to some of the prolific uh, companies out there working with Terraform about collaborating there, or that that not even like a heads up or anything like that, right? Uh, well, it's weird. What what if? What if hypothetically they did and hypothetically things were proposed and they figured that that was too much money to spend so they would do it themselves? No problem, just explain <laughs> this to community before you do anything. I, yeah. I, I can't Instead say too of... much, but that's what I would say. <laughs> yeah. Well, 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 instead of... uh... Yeah. Oh, sorry. I was just going to like take another sort of angle on this. And um, I have not used Terraform with Oracle Cloud before. I've used Oracle Cloud, but, but not with infrastructure as code. But from what I understand, Terraform is the de facto infrastructure as code approach to working with Oracle Cloud. I read that somewhere. So instead of having their own, like say, cloud formation type input, yeah. they, they just defer to Terraform as, as the source. And I'm wondering, this is just like looking way down the road, I think a week or so ago or last week, whenever it was, we talked about the whole Mongo situation and like some of the other open source approaches that uh, AWS is taking on as it goes with, you know, code that they can pick up and provide a managed service, right? So what about a AWS Terraform enterprise? And this is just kind of like the the, the seed, the embers that they get us to that point where they say, well, hey, we can manage your state. You're already doing it with S3, but, you know, just point to, you know, elastic Terraform backend and <laughs> use it that way. So a Terraform cloud, but in AWS. <laughs> exactly. So what's HashiCorp going to say then? I, I guess don't that's why they haven't made it open source. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or it would have happened. Be. And it well, it takes the kind of going backing, that right? route already. Like, there's Proton, which I hope it was, it it is going to become a way of sharing modules and pushing modules across a big company. But a that doesn't support Terraform yet, and b it's way too early. Like Proton can be a valid product in like two or three years. But yeah, I can see that happening. But still, we're in today, and I don't understand what's happening. I think that you can open VPC module. There is some discussion. Yeah, I just, just I mean, 
just for everyone, like, because you, if you haven't taken a look at it, it's just hilarious. Like, if you look at it, look at the tags that they add here. Oh, what it, you know, that tag. I mean, like, how does that make it into the main of a of a production uh, module? Well, again, that's a, that's a point that uh, they were told to treat Terraform modules as an example. Uh, so okay. you, as a customer. Uh, we'll you have to these open. and customize these. So maybe like maybe not even fork. Now. Yeah. Maybe not even fork, but copy paste uh, from GitHub URL yeah. <laughs> into your editor because yeah, that's uh, that's how it should be used. So if you open VPC model, there is some discussion. It's uh, yeah, I think this one there is at least one issue. Mm. Yeah, Andrew Brown open it. And he uh, linked to YouTube video where you guys discuss it in June. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's funny. So Andrew is really into this as well because he uh, is about to release course and uh, he's oh. wondering like w what kind of material he should be put in there. I mean, he actually made yeah. course already. Everything is recorded, written, everything absolutely finished. And uh, mm -hmm. then he discovered that, hey, now there are two collections of stuff, uh, what he should yeah. be using. Yeah. But I have to say that uh, this uh, repository actually sparkle a uh, very good uh, kind of uh, use case for regular. I don't know if you guys talked about regular in the past. No, uh, it's regular? Yeah. yeah, here you can see a um, couple files called regular in this repository. Oh, huh. regular. what is that about? Well, this is product by Fugue, uh, which is uh, pretty similar or pretty uh, much uh, what I was talking about last time, uh, where I mentioned that uh, there has to be a tool where you write uh, rules and then these rules are applied in your plan as well as in runtime. And that's exactly what Regular does. It is open source. It's, uh, it's not very popular for some reasons. Uh, but it has very good uh, tendency to be a killer of terror tests, at least to my mind. And well, I'm a big believer in this approach myself. Yeah. So, well, it, it will not kill terror tests, but it will make our life much, much easier uh, when it comes to uh, testing plans and uh, what has actually been deployed. So we definitely have to look into this. And if somebody wants to work with it, uh, guys in issues are very active and they answer a lot of questions. So it's uh, based on Rego, uh, based on open policy agent, but it has uh, some internal mechanism which can be used to, to do magic across uh, different tools and across different runtimes. So the, but they don't, they're not using, obviously they're not using get, get, get up actions uh, as part of this with anything code commit. I mean, uh, code there. But I don't seem to have anything for that. There is an AWS sample uh, EKS accelerator, which is based off another open source project, of course, that's using this mm. module. Mm. Oh, I think I saw that. Uh, there was some chatter there also that they were replacing it from using AWS community modules to using the IA modules. And that, that seemed to contradict the assertion that these are meant for you to, you know, copy wholesale and change for your organization versus use them, um, you know, as they are as remote modules. It's better right. if we ask AWS. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, should have uh, somebody on them uh, from uh, AWS on the call to uh, kind of introduce what their the goal is with it. All right. Well, there, uh, will, be, there will be some official things uh, coming um, in the near future. I don't know if, when exactly, but they they want to make 
some kind of some kind of uh, case around this whether they acknowledge that they did something wrong or not i don't know all right what uh any i was just checking the chat here seeing if there's any questions anyone have any questions for today that we can uh, help answer Any announcements, any other interesting links? Or I, posted link to, <laughs> I posted link to Terraform state migration uh, in Zoom oh, chat. Oh, OK. OK, yeah, pull that up. Oh. I have a question. General questions. A anybody here use Artifactory, JFrog? I am looking into it as well. <laughs> oh, nice, nice. Yeah, I, I, I'm been tasked with deploying it to Kubernetes, and I've never used it before. I was just wondering what anybody's opinion. Should I push back? Um, I actually found it to be pretty good in the past. I've used it at a different company. I'm working on rolling it out at my current job. And um, I've used Nexus at my last company, self-hosted. I thought it was a bit of a nightmare to manage. Uh, we went with the open source version. I mean, it worked, but there's nuances going highly available. You also have some limitations on open source. I can't speak to Artifactory open source, but at the current company I'm at, we're looking at using managed Artifactory. Um, are you looking at it only for Docker or are you looking at it? Uh, no, for, for artifacts, uh, for, I mean, for, yeah, build artifacts and for as a Docker pull cache, hopefully. And, um, yeah, I used Nexus at my last job and it was kind of a nightmare self-hosted, but you know, I, I'm very familiar with that nightmare. Uh, whereas I'm like, what kind of nightmare am I entering into with Artifactory, you know, but, um, the devil, you right. know. yeah, <laughs> uh, I'll find out and, and Maybe in a couple months we'll sync back up. <laughs> I'll let you know. So one thing that's this worth ways I've managed I've managed both of them. Um, and if you if you've got like a lot of developers doing different platforms, Artifactory is awesome because it's a Swiss Army knife. It can host any kind of content: npm, Docker, PyPy, you name it. Um, the thing that's a little annoying about it is that there is a CLI which is quite different from the REST API. Um, so you might find some things that you can easily do from the command line and other things that are that require a bit more scripting, but it's it's pretty, I mean, it's definitely way more modern than Nexus for what it's worth. Gotcha, that's good to hear. So I'd like Thank to you. shape the conversation a little bit, at least help you frame how to think about it, because it's, it's been coming up uh, more and more in customer conversations. Um, We've, uh, we, we've previously deployed Nexus. We have some customers using Artifactory Cloud. And sometimes it's about how to just, how does it fit into your overall engineering organization? I think Artifactory makes a lot of sense for you to host your artifacts for development, for CI, for uh, improving, you know, maybe performance of, of building uh, processes or ensuring that you always have those artifacts around. I don't believe that you should self-host it if you're the kind of organization that also uses a lot of SaaS. Like why introduce this one thing into the critical path, which if it goes down, your customer, your, your, your business is losing, you know, tens of thousands an hour uh, when your engineers can't do anything. Like the yeah, cost of artifact, yeah. Totally. I would absolutely, uh, we would definitely use SAS if we could, but it's a lot of work for the Department of Defense and they won't. Yeah, we, 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 <laughs> I would, I would, we, we, we would yeah. spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on it if we could use the SAS, but. <laughs> yeah. No, so I get, I, I get that there are uh, compliance considerations um, and so forth. And, and then there's other really nice things, of course, with Artifactory that you get in terms of CV scanning, vuln scanning, uh, the ability to block packages and the pull through caching and uh, all that stuff. So 
I think there is a, it's a value add if you can have it. Now, just because you have Artifactory, does that mean it has to be used for everything that Artifactory can do? Like, I no, think it's fine that you yeah. use Artifactory for Docker images as well, if, you know, for pushing CI artifacts there or for uh, um, you know, developers to pull images from there, et cetera. However, now let's start, to, let's pause in that conversation for a minute and talk about the infrastructure side. And one of the things I really hate about you introducing Artifactory on this is, well, when you, and, and this is gonna be Amazon focus because that's what I know. Um, with Amazon, everything is so tightly integrated with IAM across all the services. And if you introduce Artifactory here, now you suddenly have this hard-coded credential to pull from Artifactory uh, everywhere you need to pull from Artifactory. And I, I don't like that because rotating credentials is something we oh, all yeah. know we should be doing. Sucks. <laughs> just well, come on, Patrick, just write a Lambda. Just do the Lambda. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so, but it's custom. It's, uh, it's unique to your organization, how you do it. It's not uh, universal. So that, that's one of the things I don't like about it. So that's why I think going can to ECR is a point? thing. So that, okay. One one thing that you can do, and and I've seen it done before, is that you can throw um, API Gateway in front of it, and you only allow the traffic to come from API Gateway, and then you do your IAM authentication at the API Gateway border, and then that's pretty um, cool. It, it allows all traffic into Artifactory at that point. So I think uh, that's a pretty a cool bit, solution. Yeah, it takes a little bit more to set it up, but once you do that, you don't. Then you don't need credentials everywhere. You can still just rely on IAM roles at that point. Oh, that's really nice. cool. I'm gonna. Yeah, that's I'm gonna, a good idea. I'm gonna mesh that with my model for how how this should work. Um, but what I what I was going to say then is something slightly different. Is to decouple maybe what you're using for artifacts for CI versus what you're using for CD for continuous delivery. So for continuous delivery, I think we should standardize on how, what kinds of artifacts we use. And for most of us, it's probably a Docker image these days. Like you shouldn't care about individual NPM packages or war files or whatever as part of your continuous delivery process. So the, the, uh, the analog to this has also been like code commit. I've been wondering like, how companies seriously use code commit. Like it is a joke in, by comparison to modern uh, version control systems like GitHub or GitLab. And I have an answer for it. At least that works for me or is congruent in my mind. What's nice about code commit is its tight integration into AWS and all of its services. It's a permanent record of code at a part, uh, uh, you know, point in time. GitHub is that too, but wait, with code commit, because of the integration into everything Amazon has, including Glacier and the other things, from a compliance standpoint, it's really nice uh, that you have a uh, vault of your software stored as an automatic backup somewhere. So what if we think about things like with Heroku? In Heroku, the way you would do a deploy is you would add another origin and push code there, and then something would happen. As much as code commit is another origin for you to kick off automation within the AWS ecosystem. It's not supposed to be, in my worldview, a replacement for using GitHub or GitLab or any of those solutions. So that's the reason why I brought that up as an analog is I wanna say that's the same thing for ECR. So I don't see any problems using better tools like Artifactory uh, for managing artifacts, but in the end, everything should push to ECR and use the ECR as the delivery mechanism for your containers, whether it be for lambdas or whether it be for ECS tasks or Kubernetes pods, etc. Hundred um, percent, hundred percent. It's a little bit more like the relationship between GitHub or, or Git and um, your CI system. In other mm -hmm. words, it's, it's, it's a, it's Artifactory is basically a, a way to index your output. And so mm -hmm. if, you have a Docker, if you have a Docker image that's got you know, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of the other, and the QA guys wanna know 
you know, which release has this bug fix, mm -hmm. then that's where you want to, or that's where Artifactory really shines. Yeah. Well, and just to, I know we're running short of time, but just a quick comment on all of that. I, I like the tools external to AWS, but yes, I do like the integrations that AWS gives you with code commit and with ECR. But the way that I've worked that is to just have, have the AWS side be an integration point to the things mm -hmm. that the developers know and love like GitHub. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. code is stored yeah. in GitHub. They can do yep. their PRs and reviews, issues, et cetera, et cetera. And then all you yeah. have to do is have a hook that every time you push to GitHub, it pushes the code commit. I mean, based on the branch or whatever the case is. And then whatever you want to happen in AWS happens based on that push to code commit. So you still get all the goodness of GitHub, but you also get all the goodness of code commit. You're just not living in code commit every day. Mm -hmm. yeah, same thing with yeah. ECR too. So Eric, I'm just going to quickly one one quick comment, and I know we're, we're out of time. But um, to your you know to your Docker should be the artifact that we care about comment. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's that's right. If you if you're focused on your team is building web applications, but mm -hmm. if your team is building. Uh, well, is a shared services team, as an example, that's building NPM mm -hmm. modules that the rest of the team uses, or is building uh, developer SDKs for your product, or mm -hmm. is doing mm -hmm. a number of other things like that isn't enough. So then you do need something other than ECR to be your repository of your artifacts that the rest of the organization yeah. is using. Um, GitHub actually can also um store almost all of those things these days too so um that's yeah. a whole different story but um unfortunately like docker isn't enough in that case but well so for I, web I, applications uh, i get it <laughs> i think we still agree but let me explain so uh, think of uh think of this as a tree uh structure where um you know all there, there are different artifacts at different points of the tree that all bubble up that ultimately lead to the point that this gets deployed somewhere so oh, uh, not, not internal... necessarily that's what i'm saying like the npm package might be the product yeah but but okay but but that npm package doesn't exist to exist it exists to be used in a product that gets deployed and pushed somewhere whether by you or by other people. So I think, you know, if we're talking about that, that NPM package getting deployed and run somewhere within your organization, I think it's still congruent with what I'm saying under that hierarchy. Now, if that's an NPM module that's being distributed for other people to run, I think yeah. it's outside of this tree structure, kind of. It, it, at that point, you know, oh, but it, shouldn't push it, it, it shouldn't be because there's supply chain attacks and stuff like that. I mean, you, you want to be able to at least give somebody a unique ID for that MPA, NPM module if they need yeah. to sit it down later. But it is Artifactory what you want to expose publicly to all your customers, or is it part of the process? Basically, from Artifactory, it gets pushed to a public package uh, yeah, then it might be house, actually right? oh, pushed yeah, to yeah. like the NPM yeah, public yeah, yeah. repos. Or whatever. So, so I guess my point is, I don't think Artifactory is the end, the edge of this delivery system. Oh no, 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 like, God no. no. Yeah, 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 right, right, yeah, God no. No, it's, the 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 beauty of it is the cross referencing, because that's yeah. what kills people. Right, what kills people is having, you know, a table of Git shaws for all the source code, and then you know, a table of ISO, whatever, MD5s, but no cross-referencing in between them. That's yeah. what kills people. I agree. And that's what's so hard to do without a tool like Artifactory. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. We are uh, over time for today. This was a lot of interesting conversation and topics. Uh, I got a lot out of it. So thank you for participating. If you haven't yet subscribed to our YouTube channel, I encourage you to go youtube.com slash C slash Cloud Posse. And you can find all of our past office hours uh, segments as well as outtakes from our office hours, like some that you'll probably see today. Uh, we have our Slack team. If you haven't joined that yet, please head over to slack.cloudposse.com. Again, that's slack.cloudposse.com. Uh, we got uh, over, I think, 4,000 uh, members soon and uh, growing. If you haven't subscribed to our uh, weekly office hours, go to cloudposse.com slash office hours. Again, that's cloudposse.com slash office hours to register for next week's session. Thanks, everyone, and I'll talk to you soon.